I'll just start off. I'll spend a couple, just two minutes on the update on the run chart for the COVID cases, and then we'll get on to the main topic today. What Two things I would like to get through today. I'm not sure if we'll get all the way through them. Um, the first one is is um, looking at what are called two by two contingency tables and approaching it with um, methods where we use probability and odds. Now, the reason for doing this is um, the, these two by two analyses are really useful and common. Um, they're good to know about, and you've basically got most of the kind of tools and thinking you need to to work on them. The second reason is that um, the second thing I want to get onto is uh, Bayes rule or Bayes theorem as it's sometimes known. And this is the sort of key underlying principle behind aggregating um, evidence, but it's useful for other purposes as well. And the way that I teach you to do it requires you to use odds. Um, and I do that to avoid you having to use a terrible looking um, formula. So uh, we'll get going on this. So <clears throat> just quickly on the, the COVID situation, um, <clears throat> we're now definitely into <clears throat> a statistically significant upward shift in Canberra. Um, we've got a, a run of 12 data points there above the um, control line. So you've got this great big... Uh, oh, this is not working. Sorry. Uh, no. Sorry, just give me a sec. Um, what do I want? Shift nine. See if I can. No, it's better. Okay. Okay. So there's a great big run here of um, 12, uh, 12 points above the control line. That's the control line there, and um, we've got a bunch of points, something like eight, I think above the upper fence here. So um, we can conclude there's been a statistically shift, significant upward shift in the post baseline period. Um, the um, And we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't be claiming now that the process is in statistical control, although I'll qualify that in a moment. Um, the um, as far as the crossings go, the the lower limit for crossings is eight, and we've got thirteen crossings. So the crossings test here doesn't um, doesn't give us a finding of a significant shift, but the runs test clearly does. Now, um, the slightly unusual thing about this data is this is you know this is pandemic data, and what we have going on in Canberra is we have government, the government has imposed a, a bunch of measures, primarily a lockdown and associated um, health control measures, and also a very um, vigorous and quite very successful vaccination program. So what those two things are doing is they are suppressing the, um, what would normally be the expected growth um, under pandemic circumstances. So pandemics, um, if you don't do anything to suppress them or control them, they grow at um, what's known as an exponential rate. And what that would mean is on a, if, we, if this wasn't being controlled, um, you know, the chart would be going up like that. Um, so there is actually a, you know, very significant suppressing effect going on here. And that's why the, um, you know, the health authorities in Canberra are not particularly concerned um, by this pattern. They, to, to, they're, the terminology they use to describe it is essentially, you know, they use words like plateaued. So um, that's the situation here. But in other situations where you were not expecting exponential growth, where you were just, you, you weren't expecting any growth, you, you're expecting things to be stable. You know, if we're talking about um, you know, defects in manufacturing or delays in deliveries or something like that. Um, this would be of more concern because it's a it's a statistically significant upward 
shift. All right, <clears throat> so probability and odds. So we're just going to talk about, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the theory of probability. I think everyone probably got some of that at school and um, some of you have done statistics courses and the like where uh, you will have learned a lot more about it. But I want to make the point, it is it is actually important in um, in nearly everyone's working life, at least people who are you know, university graduates and, and working in environments where you, you, you have to be able to do a certain amount of critical thinking. It is important to understand and to be able to think with some basic ideas around probability. And what, what seems to happen is that um, probably most people get some of that. They don't necessarily get everything they, um, they really ought to know in terms of the way to think about probabilities. And one of the main things that most people don't get explicitly taught um, or don't internalize is uh, the thing that we will call Bayesian updating and which we will get to probably won't quite get to it today but I'm actually planning to talk about it in the tutorial tomorrow um, but Bayesian updating is essentially the idea of you start off with a, a prior belief about something usually a causal relationship and as you get successive bits of evidence, you um, they have a cumulative or an aggregate. Cumulative is not quite the, the right word because some evidence may increase your belief in the causal relationship and some evidence may decrease it. But you get an aggregated effect overall, over time, as you um, collect and examine and so on, more evidence. And there is a... Um, there is a hideous looking mathematical formula around that, which is um, this thing here, uh, which we won't be using. Uh, and we won't be using it because there's a little mathematical trick we can do um, that will enable us to avoid it. So I'll teach you the trick um, and some applications uh, for it. But that's not um, the only uh, reason. And odds in particular, I want to just show you some ways of using them because um, you will probably come across them. You may come across them when you're, you're doing your, uh, your cat, um, but you'll come across them in, um, in other, you know, in real life contexts as well. Um, so let's just go through a few basic things here. So I think, I hope you all know, but maybe not everyone re remembers this. Because um, for most, I, most people, and this is, this is my experience when I was in school, um, probability was... Um, a boring topic um, that I was glad to get over with and forget about for quite a long time. Um, and it's like so many things, if, you, if you're not using them, um, you just forget them. You know, you forget how to use them, how to think with them. So probabilities, technically probabilities are always numbers between 0 and 1. Okay, and that's equivalent to being numbers between 0% and 100%. So 100% is the same thing as 1, and, you know, 50% is the same thing as 0 0.5, and so on. Now, if an event, if something is certain to happen, in other words, there's no chance that it can't happen, its probability is 1, 100%. In real life, um, not many things can truly be given a probability of, um, not many interesting things have a probability of 1. Um, and in the same way, not many things have a, not many interesting things have a probability of zero. Um, a probability of zero means the thing cannot happen, is not going to happen. <clears throat> very, very small probabilities can be very interesting or concerning. So there's a very, very, very tiny, tiny, tiny probability that the Earth is going to hit, get hit by a huge asteroid and broken into pieces in the next year. Almost certainly not going to happen, but, you know, we probably possibly can't say with 100% certainty that it won't. Now, <clears throat> if the probability um, that something is going to happen is, is P, where P is the number between 0 and 1, then the probability that it won't happen is 1 minus P. So if there's a 60% probability, 0 0.6, that it's going to rain today in Canberra, which is the forecast, then there is a 40% probability, 0 0.4, that it's not going to rain. Okay, 
it always works like that. That's that's one of the there are a small number of laws of probability basically, and that's one of them. Um, if you have two or more events that are mutually exclusive, in other words, only one of them can happen. Only one of them can happen. Um, then the probability that one of them, that any particular, sorry, uh, getting myself confused here. Um, if two or more events are mutually exclusive, so that means that only one of them uh, can happen, then the probability that one of the two or more will happen is the total of their individual probabilities. If two or more events are independent of each other, in other words, they're not mutually exclusive, they're just independent, the probability that they will all happen is the product of their individual probabilities. Um, so if you've got a, <clears throat> you know, if you're a supporter of a football team and you're a supporter of a cricket team, the probability that um, your favourite team will win um, both of your favourite teams will win is the the product of the probabilities for them winning each of the two games. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we won't dwell on these, sorry, on those those two points um, very much here, but they might become relevant in uh, some other things that we do. But essentially what I've described to you there um, in a few points, that's actually, they are the laws of probability. That's all there is to it. And probabilities are very, it's quite a fascinating thing because you have these little about five laws, four or five laws of probability, axioms we call them, and then you can work everything out. Um, so from those you can actually work out this formula. But the really amazing thing is that you sort of go from a few things that you can state in a few bullet points on a page like this, and you very quickly find yourself um, descending into mathematics that mathematics students usually don't learn until um, they're in graduate school um, or at least third you know honors year or something like that uh, it it kind of probability just sort of goes off a cliff of difficulty and complexity very quickly um, anyway let's talk about odds <clears throat> so I, I, th I think most of us know this term um, the um, it's there's a there's an official technical definition of what odds are, and that's what we're going to be using. So it's the definition that's used in probability and statistics um, and mathematics more generally. The term odds is also used in various kinds of gambling activities, horse you know gambling on horse races and sports matches and uh, and so on. And in some countries and in some contexts the odds are defined a little bit differently to the official definition and that's done because they're, they're calculated in a way that takes into account the commissions that are um, that you know the casinos or the you know the, the gambling companies or the bookmakers or whatever take so if any of you are mainly familiar with um, you know betting on the horses um, your understanding of what odds mean might be a little bit different to what I explain here so um, the prop, the odds of an event, as opposed to the probability, the odds of an event is the probability that it will happen divided by the probability that it won't happen. So odds are just another way of writing a probability. If something, if there is a, if something has a probability of happening or of being true, then you can calculate the odds for it happening or being true, and vice versa. So there's two little formulas. Um, they're not very hard. So Odds are the, we'll use P for the probability that something's going to happen or something is true. And it's divided by 1 minus P. Okay, so remember I explained earlier, 1 minus the probability that something is going to happen is the probability that it won't happen. And to go from odds back to probability, it's a very similar formula, but it's got a plus sign down the bottom. So probability is the odds divided by 1 plus the odds. And... You know, if you want to sit down for five minutes with a piece of paper, you can 
well most of you can probably do it quicker than five minutes you can prove to yourself that um, those formulas are correct so little example <clears throat> so this morning's weather forecast in Canberra 60% chance of rain so that's a 0 0.6 probability and um, we can do a little uh, calculation there uh, to get uh, the odds. So 0 0.6 there is the probability. We divided by that the probability that there won't be rain, which is 1 minus 0 0.6. Uh, 0 0.6 over 0 0.4, and that gives us odds of 1.5. Now there are various ways of stating those odds. Um, so we could say the odds of rain are 1.5. The odds of rain in Canberra today are 1.5 to 1. The odds of rain in Canberra today are 3 to 2. 3 to 2 is the same ratio as 1.5 to 1. So often, um, particularly in sort of more popular con contexts like betting on horses and things, um, people like to quote odds in, uh, in ratios of integers rather than fractions. Um, and then when you know the odds like that, you can reverse them. So you can say the odds of it not raining in Canberra today are 2 to 3. Okay, so let's let's check that by converting um, two to three odds of two to three back to a probability, and what you can see there is two thirds over one plus two thirds. That's 0 0.667 over 1.667. That gives you 0.4, which is 40%, which is the probability of rain. Sorry, one minus the 60% probability of rain. So that's um, pretty much all there is. Uh, to odds, um, most of us are more used to using thinking in terms of probabilities. We we talk about probabilities of things all the time in um, in everyday life and working life. Less often, most of us um, think or talk um, in odds. But odds have a whole lot of uses, and one use, as I've mentioned, is they they help us really simplify um, Bayes' theorem. Um, but they are used quite a lot in, in reporting the results of certain kinds of experiments and certain types of studies. And that's why I say you may have come across them um, in your reading for the critically appraised topic. So particularly in some experimental contexts, uh, you will often um, see the results described in terms of odds, uh, sometimes what are called odd ratios. And there are a few other things as logarithms of odds and and so on, which we won't be getting into. Okay, now let's just go through a few more examples here and some. we'll look at some boundary cases as well, some extreme cases. So we'll start with um, an event that has a probability of zero. So what are the odds there? Well, that one, um, the uh, the odds are going to be, uh, so zero is the probability, and it's going to be zero over one minus the probability. So that's zero over one, and that's zero. So that case is quite straightforward. Um, the odds are the same as the probability in that case. The next boundary case, number two here, however, is a little bit more interesting. So this is where you have a, you know, the perhaps rather unusual situation where you have a, um, a probability of, uh, of one, of something being absolutely certain uh, to happen. So in this case, um, so P equals one. And then, uh, so what we're going to have, the odds are going to be equal to 1 over 1 minus 1, uh, which equals 1 over 0, which equals what? Does anyone have a view about that? Well, I have a view about it because when I was in year 8 at school, I was actually hit by a teacher. Um, that was back in the days when 
teachers are allowed to hit students. I was hit by a nun who was teaching me because I had, um, in, in answer to the question, I said that it was, it must be equal to infinity. And um, she whacked me with a ruler and, uh, and said, no, it's undefined. Um, and that is actually the correct answer. It's not, it's not defined. So there is no such things, thing as the odds of a certainty. In real life, that situation is not going to come up, <clears throat> really. Um, so I don't need to worry about it too much. But um, it doesn't make sense to talk about the odds of something that's completely certain. Now, um, let's look at a couple of more practical cases. So this is useful stuff to know. Um, so we're about to, I think probably next month, we'll start seeing in Canberra at least, and this, for those of you in other states and other countries, and this may already be happening where you are, or have already happened, um, but the introduction of what are known as rapid antigen tests for COVID-19. So these are not the um, PCR tests that uh, we currently use, which are very accurate tests. Um, these are tests that um, they're quick. You can get the results in a few minutes with some of them. Um, and you don't need a laboratory to perform some of them. You can, you can do them in the home. Um, but they have some downsides. So um, let's uh, start with this example here. So uh, there is this term specificity I've used here. This is a medical term about tests. And I always forget which is which between specificity and sensitivity, but um, they are the two bits of terminology that get um, get used. I'm not going to test you on them. So uh, what this means is <clears throat> um, this test has a, a clinical specificity of 97%. What that means is um, when we say clinical specificity, the, the word clinical there means um, if you... Um, This is how well it works in actual clinical practice, not in a laboratory. Okay, so they actually, when when government agencies and so on are approving these tests, they actually make sure that trials have been conducted in clinical se uh, settings in, I guess, doctors' offices or whatever. Um, so it has a specificity of ninety-seven percent. So what that means is there's a ninety-seven percent chance that a person who is not infected, okay, doesn't have COVID nineteen will be identified as not infected. So what are the odds? So what we need to do is convert no, a probability of 97% to, um, to odds. So I'll give you a moment. To, I haven't actually done the calculation. I'm going to do it now. Um, but you have a go as well. I get 32.3 so if we just round that what what the 97 percent um, clinical specificity means that if you use the test in the real world environment in which it's meant to be used then the odds are about 32 to 1 that a person who doesn't have COVID-19 will be shown by the test not to have COVID-19. Now, 
the next example here, number four, this is the, the kind of the downside of these rapid antigen tests. So with the the, the PCR tests that uh, we've been using up until now in Australia, they have um, a very, very uh, high clinical sensitivity. Okay, that is to say, if a PCR test says you have COVID-19, it's very close to certain that you do have COVID-19. There are very, very rare cases where you get a false positive with the PCR test. But it's a very expensive test to conduct. It involves a whole lot of equipment, has to be done in the laboratory, takes hours, um, and so on. So it has a lot of practical disadvantages. The rapid antigen tests, I haven't, <clears throat> I've, I've just looked at a, a kind of a, what would I call it? It was a sort of a quick meta-analysis that was done of rapid antigen tests. <laughs> So this 55% is a kind of a rough average of what the clinical sensitivity is. And you'll see the number I've given there is, is 55%. So that's a rough estimate. So, <clears throat> but that's a hell of a lot lower than the 99.9 .9 or 99.99 .9 or whatever it is um, with PCR tests. So what that means is if a person actually is infected with COVID-19, then there's only a 55% chance that the test will correctly identify them as infected. And when you think about that, that's not far off a toss of a coin. Okay, so what are the odds? So we'll work them out, same uh, kind of calculation. The probability is uh, 0 0.55, that's 55%. Okay. Uh, so the odds is 0 0.55 over 0 0.45 and that um, okay so that's only 1.2 So that's not great. Um, and I think a lot of them are a, a bit better than that, but the numbers I've seen are not particularly um, particularly special. All right. 